Celtics Talk Podcast is presented by 24autogroup.com, 11 locations across New England. What's up, everybody? Welcome into another episode of the Celtics Talk Podcast here on the NBC Sports Boston Podcast Network. And I'm going to call it, it's an emergency edition because, Eddie House, I was, uh, I was uh, you know, we were going to talk about the season, the first six games, but then I took that rundown and I just tore it right up because the news of the day is that Ime Adoka appears close to being, being named the next head coach of the Brooklyn Nets, Steve Nash, stepping aside here, uh, firing, whatever you want to call it. Eddie, just your your initial reaction to the news as we learned that that Ime might be uh, might be the guy in Brooklyn. Well, we we kind of been hearing those murmurs for the longest that if Steve Nash wasn't going to be the guy, if he got fired, that Ime's name had constantly been coming up with Quinn Snyder's name as well. But um, knowing that the Celtics also gave Ime the opportunity, if a job does come up, that they'll uh, allow him to pursue that and go. I think, <clears throat> but for me, I, I'm not sure if that's such a great job. Um, I, I think you're, you're, you're walking into a, a toxic, toxic environment. Uh, number one, it's just it seems like the, the inmates are running the asylum over there and it's nothing good has come out of there. I mean, yeah. they want to blame Steve Nash for the lack of uh, defense, but Steve Nash ultimately isn't guarding anybody. He's not getting rebounds. He's not the guy that's out there getting stopped. Now, could he hold guys accountable a little bit more? Possibly he could do that. But the fact of the matter is the guys still got to go out there and they got to play. And I think with not only <clears throat> Steve Nash is gone. Now, what do you do with Kyrie Irving with all the mm. stuff that's swirling around him? And then from that point, is Ime walking into a, a job where he think he's going to have Kyrie and Kevin Durant? And then all of a sudden one of them are gone and now it's a rebuilding. And if that's the case, then I think he does have a better chance moving forward with new pieces that could buy into what he does. Because it, the, the writing's on the wall. Kyrie's right. a coach killer. Kyrie is the coach killer. Yeah, and I don't think you're wrong. And and it's so funny because when uh, when Kyrie first came to boss, I tell this story all the time, but all the Cavs writers were like, good luck. And then early in the tenure, Celtics go on like a 19-game winning streak, and I'm thinking, hey, this is pretty fun. Then Kyrie gets injured, then he's not in the playoffs, then he doesn't show up to game seven, and all of a sudden the next year is all about his contract. And so you can see, like, at some point things go badly, and it's usually hard to salvage them. So it's hard not to look at that situation now. I'm I'm interested to see, like, do, I guess Ime was probably eager for any opportunity that would allow him to jump back in. I think, you know, he obviously has ties with this team, having been there before he came to Boston. But just as you said, it, it's going to be really hard to salvage that based on what they've got right now. Is there any way, like, is there any chance, like, because I think if, for Celtics fans, we always look at the, the the downside more than we look at the upside. Like, is there a chance this that he does, that he does turn this thing around? Can he get this thing right? And should the Celtics be worried that Ime can maybe be the one thing that could fix this? I don't I don't think so. I think no. they need more than that. The roster's not that good, number one. They're top heavy. They got two guys that are, are dependent. Uh, the team is dependent on those two guys going, and they don't play any defense. You have to get stops in the NBA, no matter what how talented you are on the offensive end. You got to end up getting stops. But this uh, again, I, I said this to somebody earlier that this could be a dead end job for for Ime for a, a number of reasons. Not no, the one that I already laid out, but that you might not have that same roster, and then you might not have the success that you were expecting. And then the GM that hired you, he might be out of there mm. after this season if they don't have a good year. And we all know how that goes. A new GM comes in. He wants to get his guys in. He wants to. So, I mean, the only maybe the saving grace would be that Kevin Durant is fully back in Ime Udoka and saying, hey, I want him to be here. And if he's doing that, then I don't expect him to go anywhere. But it's just a, a, a real tough job. And I mean, again, it's it's one of those jobs where you don't want to turn it down. But if you get in and you get fired, do you have another chance? Is there yeah. going to be a third door that opens? It's interesting to, to, to think about. And just like you said, the, the one thing that I'm left to, to spin it to the Celtics perspective is, you know, when this happened a few days before the start of training camp, it felt like there was maybe a little bit of a dark cloud hovering over that media day and the guys had to answer questions on it. I think that this reopens it a little bit, like reopens those wounds, like tomorrow in Cleveland, all the players are going to get asked about it. How are they feeling watching Ime go to a rival? And I think they're going to have to deal with it. But how do you think it, 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 it the players will deal with this Eddie, like, do you think this eliminates a little bit of a distraction? Can the, can this be a good thing for the Celtics not to have like Ime's uh, future hovering over them for the season now? Yeah, I think it's a, a, a great opportunity for closure. 
you know, because everybody wants closure. You don't like anything lingering or hovering around and you and stuff is in limbo. Not knowing if Joe Missoula, no matter what kind of job he does, does he may come back and get his job? You know, not knowing those things, a lot of unknown certain uh, a lot of unknowns that, that are going on, no unknown equations. And so I look at it like it's an opportunity for them to say, hey, we didn't know much about this anyway. We got blindsided. We answered the questions. And we wish him the best, but we're moving forward with our coach and our organization and, and this team moving forward. This team is different from last year. Uh, we have a different coach. We have some different players, different personnel, but it's still the Boston Celtics, and we're looking to move forward, and we wish him nothing but the best. And, I mean, I'm thinking that's the best way you can handle it. Yeah, and, and I do think there's a, an ability for if it's weighing on Brad Stevens, if it's weighing on ownership, if it's if it's just something that Joe Missoula fair, unfairly has to like, be thinking about, it can be a positive for the, for the Celtics moving forward to just sort of distance themselves and just kind of turn the page on that whole situation and to do it probably as fast as you possibly could, given the circumstances, I guess, put the, putting the focus on Joe, how do you think Joe's done here to start the year? Like how much it's clear that he has the trust of everyone from Brad Stevens and, you know, especially being a former assistant, how is Joe done in that coaching role to start the year? I think, you know, he's shown signs of being a first time in, in that chair um, a few times. But I think the, the most important thing is that he has to get those guys to pl start playing defense again. And oh, I think that was one thing that Emay's message was, I think, wasn't received at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. Kind of had guys like, hey, I don't know who this guy, you know, coming in. I don't like how he's right. But then they started seeing it was for the greater good of the team. I think Joe has to find his voice and knowing that he is in that seat. Now it's not an interim job. He has an opportunity to actually keep that job if he does well. So that's a good thing for him as well, because now he can focus on, all right, I got to be the better version of myself, not knowing that if it if, if doesn't work out or even if we do play well, he may could come back and I have to slide back behind the bench or maybe I get um, promoted to a, a, a higher coach and get a little bit more uh, money and I get to the front, uh, uh, get to sit next to him or two seats down. So I think, Overall, it's just good for this to happen. And for him, now he just has to find his voice. And everybody coaches different, but one thing has to happen. We have to get better defensively. I mm -hmm. think the, the game against Washington was a good opportunity for that because the team's not that good. So it's a feel-good game, a get-right game. Now you just have to start putting it together. We've got Cleveland coming up, right? Cleveland mm -hmm. is a tough team. We've seen how, how well they play. They play – they, they give you a, a number of challenges. Now, number one, we have, we're a smaller team, so they right. give you challenges on the glass. You know, you're going to have to fight. And that's something that he should be preaching. Hey, we got a gang rebound on the, on the defensive end. When that shot goes up, find the body, box somebody out. If you don't get it, maybe somebody else can get it on your team. But make sure that you're making contact. You just don't turn and look. And I think that's that, that has to be like the message that he has to be sending out. Like, hey, don't forget our identity. Yeah, I'm here, but we have the same identity. And I think – that's the one good thing about this team. It was more of a, he could step right in. And I, right. I, I said they were kind of like on autopilot because they already had the foundation. Everybody got better. He just has to kept in and kind of don't get in the way, you know what I'm saying? Kind of allow that to happen. But then when you see things going on, you definitely have to put your stamp on the game at times. So that's one of the things I wanted to ask you because I'm fascinated by this because a lot of people ask me this question and, and, and I don't necessarily know the answer is that, so you have a coach who has a very sort of stoic demeanor, doesn't show a lot of emotion necessarily on the sideline, doesn't seem to have the same post-game, you know, criticisms of like, like Adoka would call the players out. Joe has been very more Brad Stevens like in terms of, you know, just putting the blame on either himself or like we're going to get better and, and, and doing the positive spin. How does he, can a coach like that bring the same level of accountability you know, so the defense isn't playing to its its right level. How does Joe get that message across if it's not normally, you know, the same way that maybe an, an Eme would? Well, if he's a guy that doesn't call people out in the media, that's fine. But in film yeah. session, you got to call them out. Like, mm -hmm. you got to hold everybody accountable from top to bottom, not just because it's Jason Tatum or Jalen Brown or one of your star players that you kind of like sweep it under the rug and say, you know what, that really wasn't like, or act like, act like it didn't happen. Roll right past that clip as opposed to being like, hold up, rewind. Check this out. Is this the effort we're looking for? Rewind it again. Hey, you're supposed to be our best player. You're supposed to be our leader. We need more out of you. And then have a clip of somebody that's I, 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 doing that, that's mm -hmm. actually doing it. That's not the star saying that he can do it. We know you can do it. We need everybody to do it. We all got to buy in. So it just has to be his approach. And, I mean, we're all getting to know Joe, you yeah. know, in this, in this light. And I think uh, the players as well. It's different when you sit behind the bench. It's different when you're the guy that rebounds for him every day. You have a different relationship with that coach than you do with your head coach. When you get in that head coach seat, 
everything changes. You, you, you're still going to have that relationship, but it's a different type of relationship. Yeah. What I guess let's let's step back again and go ten thousand foot view uh, to, to put the the noise of today aside. Which is what are your general thoughts on the team through six games? Again, I think we all focus back on the defense, but the offense probably to me is a little bit of, of further ahead of where the I thought they'd be. I think there is sometimes when their offense has been so good that maybe some complacency sets in on that defensive end, and I'd like to see that intensity ramped up. But like the bench has been way better than I thought it would be to this point. You know what what are you most encouraged by based on what you've seen through six games? Well, I think I do like the bench. The bench has came off and gave us a, a great punch. I think Joe's done a great job by putting Malcolm on the bench and having him coming off the bench because that gives us another ball handler, a steady ball handler, a guy that can score at the rim. He can knock down the three, but he makes so many plays, and he just plays at a pace that you could tell that he's been around the league for a while and he knows how to play the game of basketball. Um, I think the one thing that I'm disappointed in, again, we've talk, been talking about it. I don't want to harp too hard because it is early, but you want to catch it early, right, is the defense. Yeah. And also offensively, uh, when it starts getting good to them, right, mm -hmm. they start settling. And then they start allowing their offense, if they're missing shots, settling for shots, not sharing the ball like they normally do when they're super successful, then that bleeds over into the defense. And that's something that has to be checked right away. I mean, you much rather have these things happening early to where you can fix it. And you have the players and you have the, the coaching staff and you have the belief system and everybody that's it, it, involved in the organization to do that. So it's better to happen now than that's something that happened late. Like, yeah, we were dealing with turnovers in the finals last year, mm -hmm. but I mean, throughout the playoffs, but it wasn't as bad during the season as it was in the playoffs. It was sure. like, because the turnovers that happened during the season last year were kind of like, sometimes they were forced, you know, mm -hmm. teams playing good defense. You got to give credit, but these ones were unforced, you know, guys just losing the ball out their hand, making bonehead passes from half court, trying to make the home run play all the time. And I think, We've learned from that, and that's the difference. If when you catch something early, you don't have to wait for it. You you don't get caught with it late when it really matters. Where there's no no get back. Yeah, I'm gonna whisper it. I think the Celtics are tenth in the NBA right now in turnover percentage. They've made some progress there. The bench has been. I mean, again, I I, I don't know what my expectations were, and like the way I look at it is Derek White, who will eventually be on that bench when Rob is healthy, hasn't even gotten to get settled in there, and they're still playing to a, a super high level. I think the the potential of that group is, is is just unlimited. It's really impressive what Grant Williams has done, you know, not getting that extension, but coming in motivated and showing off some new tricks and especially driving closeouts. And then 30 with a scope. How is it? I'm like, uh, did, did, did you expect him to come in and be this impactful this quick? I mean, we knew he could shoot. We saw glimpses last year, but especially just kind of, holding up defensively because he has enough size and you got enough talent out there. Are, are you surprised that I, I, I'm going to say, like, I'm going to, I'm going to get drink the, the green Kool-Aid, like Grant and uh, Hauser. It's like the bench splash brothers right now. The bench splash brothers. <laughs> hey, that's, I told a, you. That's, that, that's a, that's a, that's a stretch, but hey, you know what? <laughs> I think the, the one thing, let's go back to Grant Williams. I think he's handling it as a professional. Um, and he couldn't be more professional in the way he handled this understanding that he had a chance to get, um, the extension, he doesn't get it. He doesn't soak. He understands he has to be there for his team, and it's greater later. If you have success, that the money's going to come. If you play well as a team and you play well on a winning team, everything's going to come. They're going to want to sign you back, and if they don't sign you back, somebody else is going to want to give you that money. So I think he's doing a great job with that. And then uh, Sam coming in, man, I think understanding that where he's going to get his shot. You got one job to do, and that's catch and shoot. Everybody has to play defense. Everybody has to play some sort of – you have to have some resistance defensively, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be a, a lockdown defender, but you have to have some sort of resistance. You have to be in the right places at the right time. If you need to be at the nail, you got to be at the nail. If you're trapping the box, mm -hmm. you got to trap the box. And so I think that he's doing those things, and he just has to get comfortable in that role of, I'm just catching and shooting when I get the ball. And also I think he could do a, a little better job of finding spots to where he can go and just catch and shoot. Mm -hmm. Don't always just stand waiting for him to pass. Sometimes move a little bit. Your defender gets caught looking, maybe slide up a little bit, an easier pass, a quicker pass, harder for the guy to uh, rotate out to you, close out to you, and get to your shot because he has a quick release on his shot. So I think if he does those things and understand how he could get shots and also don't just be – a robot where you're just standing still waiting for it. Sometimes move, go set a quick back screen on somebody just to get some movement. And that could cause confusion as Tatum or Brown is going to work or smart going to work just enough to give you a little daylight where you can get a shot off. Look no further than the award-winning 24 auto 
Group. With over 2,600 vehicles in stock, the brands you love, backed by the savings and service you can count on. Visit today or shop online at 24autogroup.com. We're kicking off fall with big savings at Stateline Chrysler Jeep Dodge Ram. Lease a new Ram 1500 for $369 a month during Ram Power Days. Hurry in, and you'll be saying, I'm a Stateline. And we didn't even talk about Malcolm Brogdon and his black forces that uh, he got, you got that retweet on, on social media. How'd that feel like that? He acknowledging he's like at that OG game. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, uh, it's funny because like I said, he, he, he's one of those guys to where, I mean, he doesn't come in, he don't have a lineup, you know, it's just, his hair is just regular. <laughs> he don't look, he, you know, really don't have like the crazy swag yeah. out there and he just goes about his business. And that's what made me think of that is like, you see a guy, you know, he don't really have no crazy swag, and you look over at him and you look down, you're like, oh, okay, we ain't gonna mess with him. He got the black forces on. <laughs> he about their life. And uh, so no, it's good to get him though, man. It, it, I once we picked him up, I knew that was the best pickup that I yeah. think in the whole NBA this this summer. Man. Especially for a team that's looking to, to win a championship. Yeah, and it, it just addressed their biggest need. I love, I looked it up today. He leads the team in drives per game, which I didn't know when he got here. I mean, you can watch him from afar and you know that he's got a good first step and that he can get to the basket. But the, they needed that so badly with that second unit. Someone who could create their own offense and be aggressive. I think we saw that in the Washington game. But then his ability to, like, kick out to the corners. And that's why mm-hmm. Sam and Grant are able to thrive. Like, if Malcolm's breaking down defenses, it just opens up everything else for you. So, uh, yeah, just a lot of encouragement from the, from the, the bench progress. Let's end on this to, to keep on the bench theme. How are you feeling about the big man situation? They leaned on Vonley. Early in the year, got some decent returns, but a little bit up and down. His struggle with the fouls, getting Luke Cornett back uh, from the ankle injury. How do you think Luke's played, and can you get by until Rob's back with the big men that they've got? I think you're going to have to – it's going to go by matchups. I think mm-hmm. if uh, you play Luke, if it's a good matchup for you, and you play uh, Noah, if it's a good matchup for for him, I think you have to play in that way. And, and Blake coming in. You know, Blake's going to get his minutes here and there, but – Again, you have to you have to play the matchups, and I'm not saying look at that team and say, "Oh, we got to match up with them." No, looking where we could be successful using the guys that we got and make that other team match up to us. And I think a lot of people get caught up in that, like we have to match up with their size. No, you actually don't. What you have to do is play what you are, be the best team that you are, make them match up to you. You know, because when you start trying to change what you are and your identity to try to match with somebody else, you'll never be successful in that way. So I think it all depends on who we're playing and how we're playing. Um, if if you need somebody that's a rim runner that just gets out and, and put pressure on the paint, then you know we're going to put Noah Bonley out there. Yeah. If you're looking for a guy to stretch the floor, a big fella, then you're going to put Luke Cornett out there. If you're looking for somebody to do a lot of dribble hands off and do some dirty work, you're going to put Blake Griffin out there and Noah Vonley at times when – if you could spell, the thing is, if you could spell Al and don't yeah. have heavy minutes for him early in this year, early in the season, I think it bodes well for us later on. Uh, last thing, what do you think about Cornette contesting three pointers from the paint as a shooter? Would that bother you? If, if no, somebody- that, I don't know what that don't work. I, there's no way that that works. I mean, come on. That, first off, listen, if uh, if a guy closing out with his hand here doesn't work, how would somebody? <laughs> 20 feet away from me jumping straight up in the air that's not gonna work i mean not for me at least i don't know about i don't know about these other uh fake shooters out there right. but I know for me, that, that ain't working i'm gonna ask sam sam 30 with a scope will tell us if it's really working like well, he got, he's 30 with a scope so he's gonna tell you the same thing he's knocking stuff down he, he wished somebody closed out at to him like that right so it, it's it's just funny to me like uh it's worked i think i've seen him do it four times and, and every time it's missed but the problem is he's been out of position for a rebound after that, and Jared Allen kept the ball alive in that Cleveland game. So I just think it's got to be the right situation to even just throw it out there. But I need I need more I need more stats before I'm ready to buy in. I got you. You need some more data out here. I need I, I need him to bag that and close all the way out. Um, the other thing is is I think the reason why guys miss is because they're like, wait, what is he doing? <laughs> like what what is he doing? It's so jarring, you know? right? Like. I, I give him credit for, for, for messing with it. Jalen does something similar, like kind of on a closeout when he can't get to a guy. But uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I just think we're, we're deep enough into uh, basketball history that we know what works and what doesn't. And I just prefer they for, – for a Celtics team that's struggling with rebounding, just give me a box out. Give me a nice, clean box out and go chase a rebound. Uh, yeah, that would be good. All right, Eddie. Uh, I, I told you, I told you we'd be quick, but then Eme News ruined everything. So I need everybody to go like, subscribe. Check us out on the YouTube page. Check us out tomorrow night. 
Celtics Cavs. It'll be a fun one. We'll catch you next time on the Celtics Talk Podcast. Kick off ball with game-winning deals at Route 9 Nissan. Lease a new Rogue Sport for $289 a month. That's right, just $289 a month. Score your game-winning deal now and visit today or online anytime at Route9NissanAuto.com. We're kicking off fall with big savings at Stateline Subaru. Like a new Subaru Crosstrek. Drive home for just $2.99 a month. That's right, only $2.99. Score big savings today. Stateline Subaru, a driver's best friend.